We'll go ahead and get started this morning. Um, last time I was here, we were in Genesis chapter 37, and we looked at the beginning of the story or the account, I should say, of Joseph, Joseph in the Old Testament, and he was a son and had many brothers and his brothers didn't treat him very well at all. And they, uh, as we studied this, we see that he was tossed into a pit as he approached his brothers. They saw him coming and they, they were out in the flocks and they tossed him into a pit. And his blood brother, meaning, uh, well, he had brothers all from the same dad, but brothers from different moms as well. And so the brother of, his, the, the, of the same mother rescued him from the pit and uh, they were jealous because of the way he was being treated. And uh, he was favored. And his father got him a cloak of, of multi colors, multiple colors, and they were jealous of this cloak. So they took the cloak from him, dipped it in blood, and went back and told their father that Joseph had been eaten by wild animals. And so they, they went with this lie, and as time passed, we see in chapter 38, if, if you did a, uh, if you could do a brief read, not right now, but uh, it's, it's what is known as the Judah interlude. And I'm going to borrow from John MacArthur here for a second. And it says, as it sometimes is known as the Judah interlude, it's bracketed by references to the sale of Joseph to Potiphar. And such a parenthesis in this Joseph story demands some reasons why a chapter laced with wickedness, immorality, and subterfuge should be of necessity be placed in this spot. So it's kind of like a, a, a brief uh, look into the life of Joseph's family without Joseph there. And it says that the answer to th is that the events recorded are chronologically in the right place, being contemporary with the time of Joseph's slavery in Egypt. So as uh, Joseph was sold into slavery from, uh, from the pit into slavery to the Ishmaelites, the Ishmaelites sell him to Potiphar. And if we read chapter 37, verse 36, chapter 37, verse 36, if you have your Bibles, it says, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him, Joseph, in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. And so it fades out there with Joseph being sold into Egypt. And it fades into the family and lifestyle of Joseph without him there. And there is, I'll, I'll just keep reading here. The account is also genealogically in the right place with Joseph gone, with Reuben, Simeon, and Levi out of favor for incest and for treachery. Judah would most likely accede to firstborn to, st to the firstborn status. It provides a contrast because it also demonstrates the immoral character of Judah as compared with the virtue of Joseph, as we will see today. That Joseph, uh, as, as we know, has, is one of noble character. He makes the right choices. And in the events today in chapter 39, we are going to see a few lessons from what Joseph, from the decisions that Joseph made, leads to consequences that we might think are unjust, or things that happened to Joseph after he made the decision to flee from a sinful situation. We would think that something good would happen to him, but in fact, 
something happens to him that makes his situation on the surface worse. And so we're going to get into that. I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but I'm going to finish reading what MacArthur says here. And it says, It provides a contrast because it also demonstrates the immoral character of Judah as compared with the virtue of Joseph. Canaanite syncretist, Canaanite syncretistic religion and inclusivism threatened to absorb the fourth and later generations of Abraham's heirs, but Egyptian exile and racial exclusivism provided not loss of their ethnic identity, identity, but preservation of it. So what that boils down to is that with all of this uh, incest and with all of this immorality going on in their family, in the generation, this generation of the Abraham, of, of the trait, the characters or uh, generations from, that are trickling down from Abraham, things aren't going very well for the Israelites. And so they're letting sin in their lives and they're basing their decisions on the lust that they have for the Canaanites. And uh, they're in this land, and this is, so this is before Moses, this is before the Mosaic Covenant, and before the law, the, uh, the Ten Commandments had been established. And so we are in a period, if we go back, if we take a time travel back into this period, we are still, so we're pre-Mosaic Covenant and we're in the Abrahamic Covenant. Abrahamic Covenant is um, God is setting up his people and, and uh, sending out, establishing a land of the Israelites and he's trying to get them to prosper, but they're loving their, their sin and their lust far more than they are their obedience and their relationship to God. So God is pretty much not, he's cut off of the relationship from everyone except for Joseph. And so God favors Joseph at this point. And so in, the, in this chapter 38, there is, I mean, you can, you can read it. Uh, I skipped this from, I knew we were, I know we were going to go from 37 and look at the life of Joseph, but 38, we're, I'm just going to skip for time purposes and we're going to get right into back into Joseph and his life. So verse chapter 39 in Genesis verse one, and I'll pray for us before we get into that. And uh, it's it's very interesting, and I hope that we can take something away from this this morning. So let's pray. Father God, as we open our Bibles, we ask that you would open our hearts. And as we know the lifestyle of Joseph, how he was uh, able to model a character that is worthy of, of us being... Uh, Look, looking into his life and wanting to be like him and wanting to be like Jesus because Joseph being a shadow of Jesus, we want to look at his character and, and model that. We want to live our lives as a representation of his love for you and we want that to reflect in our lives. We want our love for you to be reflected in our obedience to you. And ultimately, uh, we see how Jesus lived his life perfect in every way. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for his coming and his sacrifice and for his resurrection. And we ask that you could place into our hearts the desire by the power of the Holy Spirit to live our lives and the strength to live our lives as we are going to see Joseph today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chapter 39, verse 1, it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And I'm going to stop right there already. 
So as we see him being sold into slavery to the Ishmaelites, the Ishmaelites see Potiphar, Potiphar sees Joseph, and there's some sort of trade communication going on there. And obviously uh, uh, Potiphar has something that, that they might want to trade for. But ultimately Joseph is sold a second time into slavery, and this time it's into Egypt. And we're thinking, what does that have to do with the price of tea in Texas on Tuesday? Well, God is ultimately setting up protection and provision for his people that they don't yet know about what's going to happen. And, and in, verse, or in, in chapter 40, and in 41, actually, 41, chapter 41, if, if you read through there, you see that there's going to be a seven year famine and or there's going to be seven years of prosper farming. And then in the, after that seven years is over, there's going to be a seven years of famine and seven years of famine throughout the land. Can you imagine uh, as we were studying Cain and Abel today? Uh, can you imagine the land that? that we were that you're farming not producing any crop for seven years all of the food all of the the land would be barren for seven years and there's going to be severe consequences due to this famine people aren't going to make it and so God is ultimately setting up a way to rescue his people out of Canaan out of the land of Cana and into Egypt to, so that they will be able to live and prosper there. How he does that is he, set, he, he works out a way where Potiphar, who is in charge of much, he's a bodyguard, he's the officer. Let's look at verse 1 again. It says that, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So he's living with Potiphar as a slave, but the Lord is with him, so he has been given more authority as a slave than some of the people or probably all of the people that Potiphar is in charge of. And so the Lord being with Joseph, is, is, uh, Joseph is finding favor in the eyes of Potiphar. Verse 3, Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer of his house and all that he owned he put in his charge. So Joseph was in charge of everything that Potiphar owned, everything that what Potiphar was responsible for, Joseph was in charge of. Verse 5, it came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge and with him there, he did not concern himself with anything, anything except the food which he ate. And it stops there. And, and in my Bible, it starts a new paragraph, but it's in the middle of verse 6. And it changes direction right here. This, this word now is... It's kind of like a scene change. Now, uh, everything in the house and everything in the land was prospering, and Joseph was in charge of it. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It came about after these events, after the events that uh, he was put in charge of everything, 
that his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, looked with desire at Joseph. And she said, lie with me. Now that's code for something that we all know, okay? But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge, except for the wife and the food. uh, Potiphar, he knew... Even though, remember, we're not in the Mosaic Covenant yet, Joseph knew that the master's wife was off limits. It would be uncharacteristic of Joseph to take advantage of this situation. I don't want to say take advantage, but to use this situation... To fulfill the the desires of his wife, of Potiphar's wife. Verse 8 But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put me, put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? That was the first step for Joseph in not falling into sin and not letting temptation devour him and in this situation how many times have we been in a situation and we don't necessarily have to uh, put this around the the lust of the flesh that's where this category falls into but how many times have we been in a situation where temptation keeps creeping in on us It keeps working and there's nothing in our minds and in our hearts that that can keep us from thinking of that sin. And it just works on us and it and it starts to overcome us. And we all we can think about is that sin. And what does what what's the response that that God has given us the ability to do in scripture by the power of the holy spirit repent turn flee from sin right flee from the sin it's not ever the easiest choice we have to be ahead of it we have to know our weaknesses we should expect temptation we should expect trials verse 10 as she spoke to joseph day after day he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her i hope that my character in front of Everybody here in front of the kids, in front of Sarah, in front of the world, that integrity and the the character to do the right thing, to make the right choice, because we have the Ten Commandments. We have not only the Ten Commandments, but we have the Holy Spirit. Okay, and we know that God, the Holy Spirit, is with Joseph at this time. He is giving Joseph the the ability and the power to sustain integrity at this point. And I hope and I pray that the Holy Spirit will give me the integrity 
and the character to sustain that, that, that ability to repent and flee. Verse 11, now it happened, and not only me, but everybody, everybody that falls into temptation, that they can make the right choice. Now it happened one day, verse 11, that he went into the house to do his work. And none of the men of the household was there inside. She caught him, Potiphar's wife, caught Joseph by his garment. And here we have his garment getting him in trouble again. Saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. So let's pause for a moment in this situation. Okay? Now Potiphar's wife would have been someone that you could identify as she looks like she takes some time on her appearance. Okay? I'm going to speculate here. Being, let's say, she is looked up to in society. If she was, if, if let's say, Fox News, we don't want to go with CNN. I'm just, I'm joking. It's... Fox News uh, gets gets a shot of Potiphar's wife, and and the camera's on her. She's going to look put together, okay? She's going to look like she spends a lot of time in front of the mirror, and she is going to look like she really takes care of her appearance, like she her her idolatry might even be herself. Her idolatry might be what people think of me as Potiphar's wife. And so here we have her desire. And unfortunately, her desire isn't for her husband at this time. Her desire has been for Joseph day after day. She wants Joseph. She can't have Joseph. She wants something that she can't have. And she is after Joseph. Her goal is to get Joseph to lie with her. And there is this day, this day comes when no other man is in the house. And she's thinking, this is my chance. This is when I'm going to get Joseph. Joseph comes in to do his work, to do the job that Potiphar has put him in charge of. The situation could go either way at this point. There are no witnesses. Nobody is going to see Joseph and Potiphar's wife. So to her, there is no other excuse for Joseph not to lie with her. She grabs his garment. He, <coughs> excuse me, he takes off, he leaves the situation, he flees and went outside. When she saw that he had, verse 13, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he has brought in a Hebrew. This, is, this gets even further into Potiphar's wife's problem. See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to lie with me, and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with these words, The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came into me 
to make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. So where is Potiphar's wife putting the blame? She's trying to get Joseph to lie with her and do so behind her husband's back. And where is Potiphar putting the blame? On her husband. He, she is saying, this Hebrew slave whom you brought into this house was trying to do this to me. And what happens? What do you think, how, how do you think that Potiphar would react to this situation? Would he look on it lightly? Would he think, well, if he, if he would have only known the truth. But he didn't. She deceived him. Because she had to, and I'm just going to speculate into the character of Potiphar's wife for a moment. Because she was rejected by Joseph, she has to in turn come up with a reason to why, or come up with a way to escape that feeling of being not as she thought she would be to Joseph. Meaning, she has to think of a way to make herself feel better about the situation of not being able to succeed in getting what she wanted. This instant gratification that she thought she was going to receive didn't happen. And it wasn't going to happen. So now she's trying to think, you know, was it the clothes I was wearing? Was it the way I was wearing my hair? Was it this was it the the jewelry? Was it my perfume? Because all of these things Joseph was well aware of. I'm sure as she was a very wealthy Egyptian lady, the, the culture for the Egyptians, if, if you were a wealthy Egyptian, then you would have fine jewelry, fine clothes, fine perfume. Um, you know, she, she, it wasn't like she would have been hard. I mean, it wasn't like she would have been easy to walk away from. It would have been very difficult, you know, for Joseph to flee from her. But his love for God... And the obedience to God was without a doubt far greater than this instant gratification, this instant, you know, short term gain, long term loss decision that, that he had to make. So, what happens? Well, I think that God put Joseph in this position because he had given Joseph the ability to make the right choice. And not only that, he given him the, the, the strength to make this decision, to, to prosper his people in another way. So we're thinking, our way of thinking, not, not necessarily, um, you know, I'm not putting it down by any means, but let's say that what, what should be the result of Joseph making this right decision and fleeing this sin, the, the, the ability to sin in a way you know, he wasn't coveting Potiphar's wife in Scripture. We don't, we don't read that. We don't see where Joseph would be attracted to Potiphar's wife. So what would happen? What do we think? What would be the, the just 
consequence for Joseph fleeing instead of sinning. Now, if he had sinned, the just consequence would be death. The Egyptian law would put Joseph to death for committing adultery. The consequence, however, for attempted rape, as we see here, is what she is trying to plead her case, is that this was attempted rape. And so the consequence for that action would be prison. The consequence had, had she said that he raped me, the consequence would be death. Or, you know, if it might not be death immediately, but it would be death imminently in prison. What happens anyway, regardless of Joseph's response to the situation, his righteous response to the situation. Let's look at verse 19. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, when which she spoke to him saying, this is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. So let's, let's look at this for a second. He goes from Potiphar's house in charge of everything. He had the freedom to walk in and out of this big house. He was in charge of the land and in charge of everything except for the Potiphar's wife and Anything that, that Potiphar, like it, it was, I'm sure it was a metaphor, like anything that, that Potiphar was going to take care of himself, you know, such as the food that he was going to eat, that's what he didn't have, in, that's what he wasn't in charge of. There, there were people for that. The, and, and if you read on further, uh, you, you'll meet them. And he goes from this luxurious lifestyle to confinement in a dungeon. Okay, so if you can imagine a, a dungeon in, if you go back into Genesis and look at this dungeon, it's not going to be well-lit area. It's going to be in a, it'd be like in a, in a dark, deep basement probably lacking oxygen, definitely lacking light. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't even know how, if, if there were, if they were allowed candles, I'm sure that there would have to have been candles so that the guards could see the prisoners, but he's confined and restricted. Probably I'm speculating again in chains. Uh, he can't, so he's, his, his freedom was confined to as long as the chains would reach. However far his chain would reach, that was as far as his freedom would take him. And this was because he did not lie with Potiphar's wife. This was because of his righteous decision. So how many times... Have I thought that God owed me something for making the right choice? God, this isn't fair. This, this isn't fair because I made the right choice and I should be rewarded for making the right choice. And that's what this little view we want God's view, but God's perspective of things. That's what, and that's something that Satan or, you know, our, ourselves could be deceiving. We could be deceiving ourselves in thinking that God is restricting us or confining us based on 
the consequences of a decision that we made, even though it was a rightful decision. But what happens in, in this broad s- scope of things, verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. And I'm thinking to myself, I would much rather be confined in a dungeon with chains, without light, without natural light, without, you know, the luxurious lifestyle. If God's favor is with me, I would like to think I could prosper in a situation like this. You know, we get bad news. We get, we get stuff that is so hard to handle. I honestly don't know how the world survives without a relationship with Jesus Christ. I really don't. We can, we can go without nurturing our relationship with Christ. We can go without, you know, with, with uh, on-the-surface prayer with skimming through scripture, you know, and I'm talking about myself, you know, the, these exercises that I catch myself into, you know, yeah, I, I, I checked the list off, I got, I read the scripture today, I prayed today, I, I didn't sin as much as I used to today. And that's not a bad thing. But is that necessarily nurturing the relationship that God desires to have with us? Are we, am, am I, how well am I doing in that relationship? You know, we are, we are free to go where we want to go. We are not confined to chains literally. Now, we are restricted in some aspects. But basically, we have have a lot of freedom compared to other Christians. You know, you go on to the other side of the world, and, and it's a totally different lifestyle over there. And not just there, but some other places that are that, that don't allow Christian the, the Christians to worship corporately out in public. But they're prospering because the Lord is with them. That's all we need. All we need is God to be with us. And he is with us. He is always with us. He won't leave us. He is, and and one of the things, I didn't even go off in my notes, but one thing I did write down here is that God's power, sovereignty, and providence is demonstrated and our faith can be firmly built on His character because God doesn't change. We know what to expect. To the degree that God is always going to be in control. There are some factors that could come into play. There are some things that could happen in our lives that could totally change what we think our future might look like. We're running out of time. But I wanted to share this. I I was in... 
uh, I was reading this devotional. It was one of the best devotionals I've read in a long time. And it was about, it had to do with this, this lady that was pregnant. And she ended up having a brain stem stroke. A stroke in her brain stem. And you can imagine, in, before, the, you know, pre-brain stem stroke life, her and her husband were planning what it's, what's, what's it going to be like to raise this child. What, you know, her, her husband was in, uh, t- in law school preparing for the bar exam. And so their future, their, forecast of, their forecasted future looked one way. Until this brainstem stroke occurred. And she was in the ICU for 40 days. And she said she recalls waking up. Half of her face was paralyzed. Her, her, her hearing was gone in one ear. And the eye that she could see out of was down and looking in. And she had double vision in the only eye that she could see out of. And so through several surgeries, she she lives her life in this hospital, pregnant. She gives birth. They raise, you know, her husband is is raising the child outside of the hospital, but she's, you know, the the child is is there with the mother. And then they get, you know, so the, the rehab is going well. And they're forecasting their life again. And they see, you know, well, we've made it through this. God brought us through this. And till, and until they go to the doctor another day, just like they normally would, he does a check, a scan, and he finds... A, an aneurysm behind the only eye that she can see out of. And he said, well, fortunately, you know, he, this doctor, the surgeon, is a renowned surgeon for removing aneurysms behind eyes and, and can do this, perform this surgery, and, you know, you're not... You're in, you're in good hands, you know, you're the, this, this place is where you need to be. And fortunately, she overcomes the surgery and, uh, she, you know, but, but life as they thought it was going to be, her and her husband, was far different. But they saw God's providence, his provision, his, his way of providing for them. And, you know, we don't know, we, we can't see outside of God's perspective. To think that it would be better like the Israelites as they were traveling through the wilderness, well, it would have been a lot better, God, if you would have just left us back in Egypt as slaves being beaten, not, you know, not being able to eat meals. Yeah, I know you provided this manna or whatever it is. We don't know what it is. You know, that's, that's, manna is like, what is this? That's what it translates into. What is this? I, something like that. We don't know what it is, but it's it's like bread, coriander seed. We can make stuff out of it. We can eat it. How about some quail? You know, how about some meat? So God gives them quail, so much so that they vomit it. And God's like, well, that's what you wanted, so that's what you got, you know. So my desire is that we could take these situations in our life and we can 
See them the way God sees them, trusting Him. He won't place us in areas where He will not provide for us in a way that He will not sustain us. Let me say that again. If He puts us in situations where we think it's too much for us to handle, it is too much for us to handle. But with God's strength and His providence, His ability to carry us through it, that's what His desire is. He wants, He he really wants us to draw closer to Him. His desire is for our affections to be pointed at Him and Him. He, He is Jesus Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit to be our number one affection. Okay, anything else is idolatry. And he will do whatever he wants to do to get us to draw closer to him. I'll let us pray and we'll sing our last hymn. Father God, as we Look at the life of Joseph, even though he made the right choices, even though his lifestyle was appropriate and righteous, even though he fled from sin, he was still punished. That reminds us of someone in the New Testament someone throughout the Bible, but we see him as a person, as a man in the New Testament. Someone who was put in a situation where they did no wrong, but were punished as if they did that wrong. Our sins, what what we have committed were placed on your Son, Jesus Christ. As He came from His heavenly paradise to a land that was foreign, though He created it, you created it through Him, And he was treated, sold as a slave, treated as a prisoner, beaten beyond recognition, all for something he didn't do. He didn't commit those sins. He didn't deserve that, but he willingly took it. And we thank you so much. We are without knowledge of what life would be like if that didn't happen. We don't know. We don't want to know. We don't want to experience life without you, Lord. And we ask that you would continue to work in our hearts and work in our lives in ways that only you know how. Your ways are greater than our ways. You are so... So much greater than we could ever imagine. And we can place our faith in you as you are unchanging, immutable. We know what you like. We know your righteousness. We know that you won't leave us or forsake us. And we thank you so much for that, Lord. Please continue to work in our hearts and provide us, Lord, with that faith to get us through everything that you have brought us to. And we thank you so much for doing so. In your precious name we pray. Amen.